introducing our guest, Tanner. It's, it's a lot harder to dance jauntily when I'm trying to balance the hat on my head. Beyond the Breakers, which is a show about shipwrecks, if I'm not mistaken. Shipwrecks, loss, and lessons learned from maritime disasters. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I have to say, speaking of lessons learned, listening to your uh, podcast today, you really changed my life. Um, You guys said something that I had never realized before. Um, I didn't know you could use reluctance as a plural word. Uh, And I was totally blown away by that. You can do whatever you want. Uh, that's yeah. what we've discovered. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's yeah, like it's like anxiety. Cool. Only clowns have anxiety. Like real heads have many anxieties and many reluctances. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's good to be here. I'm very excited. Been looking forward to it all day, thinking about nothing else. Oh, good. Well, I can't wait to disappoint you. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm debating. I, I was debating uh, telling our, uh, telling our listeners uh, that that I was going to come on this show. Um, not, not quite sure how it's going to go. So if I, if I get, uh, if I get myself canceled on here, uh, too bad. Well, we haven't been able to cancel anyone yet, despite our best efforts. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how erotic this erotica is. Mm. Um, yeah, actually, before we get to the erotica, um, no, actually, let's do the erotica first. I have a couple of things I wanted to say about your show, but <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, let's, I guess, let's just dive right into the porn. That is why people show up, so. Um, and so this is uh, by by the porn you're referring to, we are both referring to the story of a dildo, correct? Yeah, like all this is just sack of decoration. This doesn't need to be here, you know, like just... Okay. He said decoration, but he means light reading for later. Um, okay. Well, there's nothing light about it. <laughs> so um, I have never received the porn. So if we're all going to be reading it and doing characters together, I need a copy of that there. Kelly. I might have only sent it to Josh. This, is, this isn't this is possibly entirely my fault. So I'm just going to let you two work your magic. and. Uh... Yeah, I guess while he's doing that, I will show you this. Um, so listening to your podcast, I think I was ta- telling you, I was kind of scrolling through um, and I was like, ah, OK, this is the one I recognize, which, of course, it's the Edmund Fitzgerald, which is like very well known in pop culture. Like you guys talked about on the podcast, Gordon Lightfoot wrote a song about it. Um, so I was supposed to be doing my character sheet and instead I made this. Um, I've also been watching. the <laughs> <So>. <laughs> uh, Yes. <laughs> I've never, uh, I, I've never watched The Witcher, but I, I, I know enough to get it, so it's good. I, Very yeah, nice. I've, I was watching the show, and then my husband's been playing the game, so I thought that was... <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Good. Glad. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> um, and then I was uh, going to share with you, actually, the first... So um, you were talking about the Gordon Lightfoot song, which is obviously, like, the most famous pop culture reference, I would say to the Edmund Fitzgerald and the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Um, the first time that I ever heard of it was slightly a slightly more irreverent song. Um, it's by an Alberta band called Captain Tractor. Um, so they're from our province. Um, and the song oh, is- about, Already skeptical. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty good. Um, it's, uh, they're like a kind of an Irish Celtic inspired, um, like they have like kind of, yeah, Canadian themes, but more Celtic sounds, um, but they uh, have a song about getting absolutely trashed, fall down drunk. Um, and one of the verses is about how he falls down and hits his head and uh, goes down like the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Um, and that was the first time I ever heard of it. And I asked my dad about it and that was how I got that. And he and then he played me the Gordon Lightfoot version, which is obviously much more solemn and, you know, um, yeah. talk a little bit more about the tragedy of it. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah, much more appropriate, not sacrilegious like mm-hmm. like this uh, like this Captain Tractor uh, mm-hmm. that we've got here. So, yeah, what does he know about ships, anyways? He calls himself a captain, but uh, yeah. 
So I, I, I cannot underestimate how badly I fucked up here. Uh, the, the, this PDF is too large to share over discord apparently. And, uh, this means I need to email to you guys. So why don't you guys all just go ahead and say your emails to me live on stream here. <laughs> well, I'm going to message you that privately. Um, that's just, I'm, I'm going to eagerly anticipate you doing that. And then I'm going to read it out on stream. <laughs> um, while we're talking about emails here, I, I do want to point out that in my email, where I have the uh, the erotica email from Kelly, it is right under a campaign email from Mandela Barnes um, uh, from here in Wisconsin, uh, the subject heading of which is just pummeled. Okay. So those two go well together, I feel like. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Is Democrat yeah. Democratic messaging really has to get so, better, I think. I only half listened to that. Do you have like an a, an erotic email called pummeled from like somebody campaigning? I would prefer if they were sending me those types of emails rather than continuing to ask me for three dollars um, every <laughs> every week. Um, but yeah, the uh, the messaging is not really on point. Got to got to do better than that. Mm. Um, that's not an inspiring uh, subject heading there. So sorry, is that the is that someone that's running for like a place? That is a I I forget that I'm talking to Canadians here. I'm sorry. Um I'll do better. But um he is a uh he was the lieutenant governor uh of Wisconsin and he's running for Senate now. Oh, okay. uh, and he's he's trying to replace uh Ron Johnson, uh one of the one of the largest shitbags in America. So uh, he definitely has my vote, regardless of whether he asks me for money or he sends me erotica. I'm, I'm he's got my vote. So <laughs> does he get your three dollars if he sends you erotica? Uh, well, I mean that's, I mean that really all depends on the quality of it. I'm, I'm prepared to go up to as high as fifteen, depending on what he's sending me. Uh, okay, is that does that go for anyone or just like people that you're supporting while they're running for senate? Um, I, I do like to keep that just to the Senate. I have different parameters, and that is what I use for my, my Senate uh, votes here. Okay, good. I was going to say, because if that's all that it takes to get people to send you $15, like, I could be I could be writing so much erotica right now. I could put a, my job I, on this full time. I'm a single-issue voter, and that issue is erotica. <laughs> that's the important one. I don't... Ron Johnson sounds familiar. Do people call him Ron John sometimes? Is that a thing that's must. real, or is that something that I've made up? Maybe. Um, it's quite possible. I'm sure someone has done it. Um, I never have, personally. Um, but, you know, to each their own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, like, on that note, you seem to have a pretty good understanding of the people in your kind of political area that you might call shit cunts. Is that correct? Uh, somewhat, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of them in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin has a particularly uh, a horrendous GOP, um, but uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot of them to choose from here. Yeah, because our our last uh, guest provided us with an entire PowerPoint presentation on you know local shit cunts who had lost their seats in the election. So I'm wondering if you'd kind of prepared something similar for us because we kind of have expectations now. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't brought that with me. Um, it's something I could probably whip up. Uh, there's, there's again, plenty to choose from, but no, I've let you down here. Yeah, well, we've made a, we made a habit of just doing the stuff you should have done days ago on stream. So now that I'm done with sending the erotica to uh, Nicole and Josh, then why don't you go ahead and just make a PowerPoint presentation and we'll keep, we'll keep it, uh, we'll hold the fort down over here. Can I do a Prezi instead? I mean, I'm I'm not picky about brands. I'm hands off the wheel. All right, all right, cool, cool. Can I? Which is a great way to get into a shipwreck, incidentally. <laughs> <laughs> Ew. Okay, so is this a pun? So it's a, the the erotica story that we're reading today is a, a story of dildo, but dildo is spelled D-I-L-D-O-E. Is this a pun, or is this just poorly spelled? I think that's just an old-fashioned spelling of dildo. Okay. I, yeah, yeah, that I, was my I, read on it. I know I said I promised there'd be new it. erotica, but there it was. It's very old erotica. Now, see what I think would be funny though is because it says story of a dildo, a tale in five tableau. I think it would be funny if they spelled dildo, e a u x. Uh, although I guess that would be plural. So, 
that wouldn't well, work. Well, that's the sequel. They're going to have the multiple dildos in the sequel. Like, you got to get, you got to start people. You can't ratchet up the, st- the stakes right away. Mm-hmm. The dildo cinematic universe. Yeah. <laughs> well, in this case, it's more of like a dildo prosaic universe because it's all written. <laughs> that's true. Um, this is, when is this from? Is is this, what, what? I think, I think it's written in there if you're looking at it. Oh, 1891. So, oh. very nice. Yeah. Right. Very classy. Yeah, here's a here's a question I have because we have to stall until Josh gets back to read this erotica. Um, you're so you're something you've become maybe more of an old timey nautical expert. How did the pirates get their hats to stay on over their headphones or sailors? You know. Well, I think the 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 issue with the hats is that the hat was never designed to fit over the headphones like that. The AirPods were much more in vogue. Um, starting around the, you know, the kind of the golden age of, uh, b- the Buccaneers, you know, talking about like the late 1600s there. Um, so yeah, really that whole, the whole image of, you know, the, the bicorn or the tricorn hat on the pirate really is a construction of Hollywood. Oh. So, okay. So do you have any like suggestions for how I can get around this problem? Because the, I mean, I would love to take off the headphones because, you know, I hate to use the P word, but it's starting to make us look like a bunch of podcasters here, which, you know, we, we obviously can't abide. Uh, but I am also a huge dork and I got mad about the echo in my audio before. So I can't just play through the speakers anymore because I have to spend hours and hours and hours on uh, audio feeds that people aren't listening to. I don't know. Are you asking us to solve your problem for you? Because this kind of sounds That's like That's hundred percent what I'm asking. Um, then no. All right. Well, at the very least, uh, we've stalled long enough for Josh. So, um, so, but I, I maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves here because I had offered to you, Tanner, that since this story had a narrator and three characters, the four of us can do it. But you're, you're, the, you're in charge here. How do you want this? erotica to be read do you want to just do the whole thing yourself um i would prefer to divide up the work a little bit i don't want to have all the fun um but yeah in terms of in terms of parts that you want to break it into i'm fine with whatever i'll narrate i'll be flora i don't care maud Oh, I thought you meant you were going to like just play all of the plants in the story. Like, oh, I'll just voice all the flora and you can voice all the people. <laughs> you can be the fauna. I'll be the flora. Uh, there shouldn't be any fauna in this story. I feel like that would get into some really bad territory. I mean, it is dildo with an E, so. Oh, uh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I hate to be that guy but i my pdf is not showing correctly so i don't know if i here maybe oh actually you know what i'm gonna open it try and open it as a pdf and not a doc (sighs) all right right, so while while she's figuring that out tanner why don't you just forcefully assign us some roles here um okay well i i can be the narrator that's fine i can do that that's cool um, that's, that's probably the good, like, proper coward way to do it. It's just, a, you know, default to being the narrator. Yeah, that's good. Um, who do we have? Laura, Maud, and the dildo? Are those the other parts? Oh, the dildo <laughs> talks! Is the, are you reading the same story as I was? <laughs> no, who's the, who's the, the third uh, person? Uh, who, who, what's, the, what's the other part that we need? That's a great question, and oh, Laura, would... Flora, Laura, and Maud. <laughs> Flora, Laura, and Maud. Okay. Yeah. Um. All right. Does anybody particularly want to be Flora? Kelly, do you want to be Flora? Uh, yeah. You know what? I want you to. I want you to dom us and just tell us. Tell us who we are. All right, Kelly, you are Flora, and then we've got Laura, is, uh. Nicole. Nicole, right? And who's our last one? Maud. Mm-hmm. All right. And Maud falls to. I've forgotten the name. Who's well, our? That'll who's be our... that'll be Josh, but he's okay. he's not turning himself on in front of us. There, there we go. go. Now he's doing it. All right. Maud, Maud is inappropriate for him to turn himself on on camera. Yeah, we All try right. to save that for after hours, Kelly. Come on now. 
Okay, I've are... successfully opened the PDF. So I'm you know I also have it craps from open. props for me there. I'm glad that you guys have figured out Adobe. You'd be amazing how bad my technology is. It's still trying to load it. I don't know why. I didn't think PDFs were that big, but it was not letting me send it. You said it starts on page 17? Yes, on page 17 is where we start with the dream. God, we're so prepared. All right, yep, I'm, I'm ready whenever anyone else is. Check. Wait, am I Flora or Laura? I've already forgotten. You're, uh, you, you're Flora. All right. Also, I noticed that there's literally a typo the first time that they use that character's name. Oh, cool. Says, Incredible. It just says floor. Um, <laughs> all right. Are we ready? Mm-hmm. Whenever you are. The story of a dildo. A tale in five tableau. Tableau one. The dream. Madison Square is a fashionable locality in New York, attractive in its architecture, its position, and its inhabitants. Well-to-do merchants, cotton brokers, railway contractors, and bankers lived there. And there, their fashionable wives and daughters gave receptions and held parties that were the talk of New York society. The belle of Madison Square was Flora McPherson. She's been celebrated in song for his for it was Flora McPherson of Madison Square that made three separate journeys to Paris in search of novelties when she had, quote, nothing to wear. That is, nothing that was not perfectly fresh within the last fortnight. But this history deals with events in the life of Flora before she made the celebrated journey spoken of. As yet, she was but 17, plump, fair, rosy, with a wonderful fund of spirits, quick at repartee, and altogether what the Yankees call a smart gal. Flora's father was from a Scotch family, and the acuteness he inherited had enabled him to take advantage of numerous lucky chances in the way of railway work, the result of the combined skill and luck being a fortune. Flora was his only child. Her mother, a woman devoted to fashion and not companionable to him, so that Flora was indeed her dad's idol, and all that money could purchase her, she had. Her private purse was always well replenished, and she was in many respects a girl to be envied. Of course, a young lady... Her private purse, is that a euphemism? I think that's a little bit of a double entendre there. Um, (laughs) Cool. I think that's what that is, maybe. I'm glad I wasn't Um, the only one that got that. Her private purse is always well replenished. Good to know. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wasn't sure, but if we were going to, you know, uh, if slow down to comment on the the wordage here, but uh, I, I was looking at these terms, these very outdated terms, like smart gal. Are we still allowed to say that? <laughs> <laughs> you, no, you'd get you'd get canceled for saying that. OK, well, then good thing you said it. <laughs> um, it doesn't count if you're quoting someone. That's the rule. <laughs> um. All right. Of course, a young lady with such considerable personal attractions and with such an ample stock of dollars in perspective was not without admirers. But as yet, no aspiring young gentleman had made any impression upon her. She was heart whole, and though fond of society, at every gathering, she seemed to take more pleasure in the society of her young lady friends than in that of any gentleman who hung over her chair and poured his vapid small talk into her ear. Her two close companions were Laura Addison and Maud Trump. What Laura a sexy was... name. Can we just stop and admire? <laughs> Maud Trump. <laughs> These are my two friends, Laura Addison and Maud Trump. <laughs> <laughs> like, how could the, how could the, the many, the gentlemen even notice Laura Addison or, or, you know, Flora for that matter, when there's the beautiful, sensuous Maud Trump over there. Maud Trump. Oh, so man. can we clarify, was the author of this a woman? Uh, oh god, we'd have to scroll uh, up to find that out. Oh, there man. are a couple, yeah, there are a couple of uh, indicators here that I'm wondering if I'm right on. It doesn't say. Hmm. I guess we'll never know. So yeah, the specifically the vapid. What was it? The vapid, vapid small talk that men are pouring into her ear. I was like, oh, that screams of like <laughs> someone that is like sick of dudes coming up to her and fucking trying to approach her but then also the part where she just casually is just like yeah the mother fucking sucked (laughs) like obviously (laughs) obviously her dad hated the mother 
is like a little bit i guess that's just like boomer shit but mm-hmm. i guess more than boomer shit at this point but anyway. yeah what what's the what's the generational name for people in the 1890s do we have one of those gilded agers i don't know um all right uh where are we mod laura addison and mod trump uh laura was the youngest daughter of a cotton broker a charming girl about flora's age but dark warm and impulsive a good heart and a genial temper with southern blood in her veins that made her passionate and daring I don't love the southern blood daughter of a cotton broker here. Yeah, so um, far off to a bad start. Problematic. Mm, does um, not bode well for Laura. Maud was of a German family. Quiet, subdued, lymphatic, dreamy, and poetical. But her quiet eyes shewed a nature you could put firm trust in. And anybody who secured the affection of Maud Trump would have a friend steadfast and true. I can't say her name. <laughs> yeah, everyone's everyone's putting Maud Trump immediately in the friend zone. It's like, hey, Maud Trump, you're really trust me, you're really. Oh God. You must. I. You're a really beautiful woman for someone, and I. I really uh, see you as a friend, steadfast and true. Ah. <laughs> uh. If I had to describe you, I would describe you mainly as lymphatic. Uh, I think that's a good. Um, you know, there's just Ma- not enough lymphatic women out there anymore. <laughs> you know, we need to we need to return to tradition there. That lymph. Um, <laughs> two two p's, two h's. What uh, that lymph do? <laughs> um, Maud was older than the other two and was engaged, but her lover held an important position in a mercantile house and was now in Europe for a year or two on business, so that for consolation during his absence, Maud was much in the society of the two girls. It was a quiet autumn evening when the three sat together in Flora's boudoir. They had not... They had not been discussing Shakespeare in the musical glasses, but a theme more interesting to all women. Love. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare in the musical glasses, my new band name. Please continue. (laughs) Flora and Laura had been congratulating Maud on the approaching return at the return AF, uh, her fiance. <laughs> he's going to be there so hard. He's, he's returning he AF. <laughs> um, the, retur- the return of her fiance uh, to be followed soon by her marriage, a prospect that poor timid Maud seemed to dread. Oh. Oh shit, it's me. So you wish that courtship could go on forever, do you? Well, said poor Flora. girl. <laughs> said Flora, who is not the Southern Belle here. <laughs> what? I, no, oh, is Laura the Southern Laura, Belle? Laura's the Southern Belle. But you, I, did it say I'm from anywhere else? You're from New York, I guess. Okay, <laughs> I'm not going to check that. I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm caught in here. <laughs> So you wish that courtship could go on forever, do you? Well, poor girl, it's rather rough on you to have a slice of two years take out of a pleasant courtship. And then on Henry's return, before you've got used to him again, to be... I don't need to fan myself if I'm not a Southern Belle. (laughs) Well, uh, where was I? Reading here. It is rather rough on you to have a slice of two years take out of a pleasant courtship, and then on Henry's return, before you have got used to him again, to be hurried into all the abruptness and reality of matrimony. <laughs> Still, Maud, my dear, realization, <laughs> in spite of metaphysics, must be better than anticipation. No, I don't know what that means. I know my dinner itself is better than the pleasure of expecting it, and it would take some powerful argument to convince me that a husband we can love is not better than a lover we can ditto. What do you say, Laura? A lover I don't know what, what ditto means here. <laughs> I, I, I read that as... I, I read that as she's she's using ditto, I think, re- regarding the love aspect, saying, why would I love a husband when I could just love someone that I actually love? Mm. Unless ditto is just New York slang for a dildo. <laughs> <laughs> a lover we can, it's just diddle. It's just diddle. It yeah. hasn't like, Maybe. No, um, also, I think, Ke- Kelly, I think the voice you're doing for Maud, or the voice you're doing would is exactly how I imagine Maud talking instead. <laughs> yeah, but she's, she's German, so that'll be a fun one. Oh, I'm not, I'm not even remotely going to attempt that. 
<laughs> well, I've already I've already committed to it. Oh yeah, okay. So she's saying that like dinner, it eating dinner is better than waiting for dinners. So having a husband is better than like being in courtship. Yeah, that's I, how I read. She's just making I, like a parallel structure there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. All right. So I, I, I'm done talking then. <laughs> oh, I am with you, my love. By all means, replied, replied Laura. Laura. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> for my part, I quite envy Maud her good fortune. Henry is a fine, manly fellow, and I'm sure he loves her. <laughs> and his two years in Europe have no doubt improved him, if that were possible. I, I anticipate her a very happy life. Oh, you mis- quite mistake me if you think I have any dread or doubt about my future. Said Maud earnestly. It's the actual plunge itself that I dread. I don't pretend to be any more modesty than any other girl, but I regard with positive horror the idea of, or... Of, well, I suppose, I need not be afraid of my own sex, of a man knowing all about me. Fancy now, feeling a man, a naked man, getting into bed with one. Ugh. And Maud positively gave a shudder. I think I see where this is going. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would like to hear a little bit more German uh, coming Oy. from Maud. Oh, you quite uh, mistake me if you think I have any <laughs> dread or doubt about my future. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I will see fancy now a man, feeling a man, a <laughs> naked man, getting into bed with me. Ugh. <laughs> uh, uh, who we have now? Uh, Laura, I think. Oh, asked. sorry. Ha ha! Laughed quick, impulsive Laura. Oh god, who's this? Oh, it's me. It's still you. <laughs> Why, my dear child, you shudder at what most women look forward to with supreme delight. And as for getting into bed with you, if I am any judge of Henry's disposition, it strikes me that he will get into more than that. Oh, there now, I beg your pardon. I didn't mean to say that, (laughs) but but the thought came and slipped out. Sorry, I missed. And she blushingly put her hand before her face. I missed oh, that. she did Sorry. it visually. It was great. It was great okay. visual work. This is why it's okay. not an audio medium. <laughs> okay, I see. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't on the camera there. Um, let's see. Maud blushed, and Flora could not help laughing. Well, Maud said, "Flora, I can sympathize with you to some extent, but only to a limited extent. <laughs> from my part, the shock my modesty will receive from the presence or even the contact of my husband." Will, I feel certain, be less than what I shall suffer from what I call the indecent exhibition of a wedding. In the privacy of one's own chamber, with only one's husband to see your blushes, I think there's nothing but what one can get over. But I think it's something awful to be dressed up for an occasion and be stared at by a lot of people who know perfectly well, even down to the youngest boy or girl, what it's all for and what you're going to be done to. (laughs) Oh, boy. Yes, said Laura. I have often thought of that. Why, when I was only 11 years old, I was a bridesmaid to Mary Parker, and as we came out of the church, the remarks made by the low boys shooed all they knew. Shooed, they all knew what it meant. It was something awful. Why, one boy positively called out, Oh, my eye, there's another shop going to be open tonight. (laughs) And the coachman... (laughs) And when the coachman drove the carriage up, he didn't come close enough to the curb. One man said, now coachman, come up. The lady can't, young lady can't stretch her leg out all that way. And then a nasty rough fellow says, oh, never fear. She'll stretch more than that if he's up to his work by and by. Oh, oh. oh my dear. I thought poor Mary would have fainted. Yes, a, wed- a wedding is all very well for the dresses and all that, but it has its dark side as well. What weddings are these people going to? (laughs) Shit was crazy back in 1890. Now to tell you the truth, said Flora, and I shall, since we on the topic, speak without reserve, that remark the man made about, well, about stretching was rude but apropos. And it sets me thinking whether, after all, the embrace of a husband is such a desirable thing. I know I once heard Mama, when she little thought I was listening, tell a lady about the remark a young lady made who was congratulated on a wedding day. 
I didn't quite catch the word the voids, but I know the idea was that it was a fun thing to be congratulated upon to be torn all to pieces the first night. Oh no. <laughs> Sorry, I laughed a lot on that one. Do we need to take that line again? Um no, I'm good. I'll, I don't, I don't I, I'll allow it. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, I did not quite catch the voids, but I know the idea was that it was a fine thing to be congratulated upon to be torn all to pieces the first night. <laughs> I can't help thinking that the actual pain inflicted must be awful and not worth the pleasure they say comes after it. <laughs> I cannot give any opinion, said Laura, about a first embrace and the pain it entails, but from an accident I can give you the an idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Laura, we know it wasn't an accident. About the first embrace and the pain it... Oh, sorry. But from an accident, I can give you an idea of the pleasure. Oh, you need not look so. I don't mean in my own experience. But when I was down south on a visit to Uncle Morris's plantation, I got overtaken one night by a storm and crept into one of the sugar houses for shelter. And there I fell asleep in a corner. When I, when I woke, I found I was not alone, for a smart young white man was there. One of the overseers, and a young woman, a pretty oh, no. active. Oh, boy. Oh, oh boy, oh. Nicole. Oh, no, now, no, no, I no, no, no. I did cheat by looking this up, but what do you no. think a is? I, 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 know, I know what a is. Yes, dude. And, 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 that's, and that's hopefully the last time I will say that word. Yeah, let's um, maybe stop saying that one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a Google one. Oh, no. <laughs> I hate this. I hate that I learned this today. Did you find similarly that, you know, because refers to a, a quarter, I mean, a quarter something. We don't have to get into it. But then if you're one eighth of that same thing, you're an. <laughs> mm hmm. Oh. Um, yeah, that's a it's a it's a troubling aspect of uh, New Orleans history. The uh, uh, Q word balls that they have. Um, yeah, you could look those up, too. Um, yeah. Balls. We'll move, we'll move on like yeah, a ball, that's, that's... like a party. Yeah. Sweet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe start from pretty and just move on past that. One. I, I knew I was going to get canceled because of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anyone's going to get canceled, it's going to be me. God Don't damn it. <laughs> um wow i already hate where this is going <laughs> they were talking earnestly together and i listened at first thinking some plot was on for the slaves were in a dangerous state just then good lord i found a dangerous state so like alabama <laughs> <laughs> a dangerous yeah. no shit a dangerous state you mean <laughs> trying to get their freedom um i found however that this was only a love scene and i was doomed to be present at and oh my dear girls, I shall never forget it. After a lot of kissing and toying, the young man, Tony Barker, I found was his name. Oh, she just doxes him in front of all of her families. <laughs> her, all her friends. Got her aunt got her onto a lot of sugar bags and made a capital kind of bed in a corner. And being thrown on a pile of canes was like a state bed and gave me a full view of the whole proceeding. Flora and Maud drew their chairs eagerly up to Laura, and in one breath exclaimed, Oh, do oh, tell, tell us, us about, about it. it! Well then, in perfect confidence, I will. After kissing and playing, Tony, for I learned to call him that, took out his dilly. <laughs> his di dilly. I don't know why I said that with a British accent. His dilly. Oh, don't be so stupid, said Flora. As to call it a dilly, and that is only what they say in the nursery about a little boy. Surely you know some more manly name for a full-grown man's... What? Said Laura, laughing. Why, you hesitate yourself before naming it. However, if it will please you, I will call, you, call it by its proper name. And in these days of women doctors, there can't be any harm in that. Oh, well, thank God we have women doctors so we can say the word penis now. <laughs> Women doctors, am I right? Doctors. Oh, what a revelation. Well, he took out his penis <laughs> <laughs> and put it into her hand. And oh, it was a tremendous fellow. I couldn't take my eyes off it. It <laughs> made me burn with blushes. 
and a great staring stiff thing with an immense red head, enough to frighten anybody. However, Juno... <laughs> Why did I get Laura? <laughs> Juno was not a, fr a bit afraid of it. She fondled and caressed Sorry, what kind of girl was Juno? <laughs> she was a nice one. Okay. <laughs> uh, she fondled and caressed it and actually kissed it. Then she laid back and he lifted up her clothes and I cert and certainly I never saw straighter or handsomer limbs than were displayed. Well, he got over her and in a moment inserted his pego. Pego, yep. spelled P-E-G-O-E, -E for those listening. Is is that Pigo? Like, what is that? Pigo, Pego. Pego, eh? Pego, eh? All right. Yeah, Ooh, go with it. Actually, we're almost at the end of a section. We can, we can plug through to that. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Said Flora. <laughs> I've caught you. There's another name for it, and a name I saw in a bad book. Oh, Laura, you have to read the book, too, or one like it. <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, I have read one or two, said Laura. For I got at my brother Tom's box one night, and one day, <laughs> hunting for a trinket I thought he had stolen from me in fun. And there I found one or two books. However, don't spoil my story. Well, when he got in, she gave a slight scream, perhaps of a little pain. But in a minute, he, I was changed, I'm sure. For, to, it was changed, I'm sure, to pleasure. For as he pushed in and out, she kept exclaiming, Oh, 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 I shall die, and you will kill me with the pleasure. <laughs> and at last he shot into her his sperm. She clutched him in ecstasy and fainted with delight. I could hardly contain myself, and I felt a most extraordinary sensation in my drawers from sympathy. <laughs> the, that's the sexiest way to refer to those, is drawers. <laughs> um... <laughs> Um, oh boy. Uh, during Laura's narrative, the color of the other two girls came and went, and their countenances and nervous twitching of their lips shooed the story excited them. Oh, I wish, said <laughs> Flora, that it were possible to taste such pleasures without the danger and the wickedness of a man. Well, so it is, said Laura, if you are bold enough. Perhaps not the real thing, but at any rate, an excellent substitute, as they say of marmalade. <laughs> oh, whatever could you mean? Said Maud. <laughs> <laughs> well, my dears. Said Laura. You must know that when I read this book, by the by, Flora, you must tell me where you saw a bad book, as, I, as you call it. I found at the end an advertisement of an instrument called a dildo. Oh, yes, I have hoid of it, said Flora. Well, I have, in fact, the advertisement in my purse. I will read it to you. Um, and she read as follows. The dildo or lady's syringe. Ooh. <laughs> now that, to me, is as good a note as any to end with that on. <laughs> you don't the want to read syringe. the dildo? I think that uh, I think for the first introduction of the term, since it's new to them, I feel like it would be like an instrument called a dildo. <laughs> Stress <laughs> That's to be fair. Um, uh, I'll take very that. Nice. that so, dildo. Very nice. very All right. Well, that was cool. Yeah. Neat. On second thought, I don't know why we do anything but read erotica because it's by <laughs> far the best part of anything we do. <laughs> the whole show now. Ooh. But I'm yes, just glad uh, I I'm just glad that I have people to read this story with. So it's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that now. worked out really well for you because I thought, wouldn't it be fun if the guest had to like, you know, uh, embarrass themselves for once with the reading just batshit insane sex scenes? But somehow that just turned into me and Nicole doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but as uh, until the game starts, I, the producer, will vanish behind the scenes again, and I'm definitely not tending to my cat who is meowing obnoxiously behind me. Cool. Yeah, fuck off. Thanks, Josh. Um, so I think this person must have um, tuned in a bit late because earlier she was referring to how her purse, what was it, her private purse was frequently rejuvenated. Um, so we were we were we were discussing about how we think that purse is a euphemism. So good catch. Oh, no, he's been there the whole time. Really? 
Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, right. They were the first comment. That's oh, Tanner. Hi, Tanner. He briefly usurped your job, but we haven't released that episode yet. That's t- Tanner? Yeah. Oh, Tanner. Meet Tanner. Oh, another Tanner. Oh, oh shit. Oh, shit. Very nice. All right. All right. So, I mean, we could we could do a bit of our... Uh, we could do something approaching an interview. Mm-hmm. Or we could dig into the question jar. We could do interview questions. I'm cool. I'm cool. Well, we know I you're got, cool. I've you got nothing to hide. I got nothing to hide. <laughs> you're making me suspicious. I feel like now it needs to be an interrogation and not an interview. I can turn on Did my. You pause I can the turn on Fitzgerald. Was that I can you? Turn, let me turn on my bright light to make it feel like I'm getting interrogated. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> do you want to be the good cop or the bad cop, Nicole? Um, I think we should do bad cop and worse cop. Like bad cop that's bad, but like mean, and then also bad cop that's bad at their job. All right. In the same accents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Officer Maud. Or no, hey, that would be Hey Tana. Listen. <laughs> I got I got an accusation to level at you. I'm pressing that X to doubt button. So did what why did you get into the nautical stuff? Did you just do it for the jokes? Um mainly for the women um i would say <laughs> by that do you, you mean know? like the ships because they're all like yes they're all exactly. anthropomorphized in that way um exactly i'm gonna turn this off because i hate it <laughs> oh you just made it bright um because um, i noticed this like n- not only does a lot of the maritime this is why i got so distracted trying to listen to your show today like not only does the slang really lend itself to just endless riffing but it really adds it to it when we anthropomorphize the ships and you know, also make them all female coded. So like, mm-hmm. you know, it'd be like, oh yeah, she went down after she took a load that was too big for her to bear. And you're like, <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. After, after she broke her back from carrying too much. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, um, that's a cool aspect of it. The, uh, oh man, I had something I was going to riff off that perfectly and I've lost it. Um, see, this is why, this is why I like the podcast medium. Cause if I do that, can just add it in later and pretend I said it at the time. Um, well, we've said it a million times. We'll say it again. That's exactly why podcasters are cowards because you know it's like nobody wants to watch people walk tightrope above a net. Like fucking mm-hmm. boring, right? So no one wants to listen to someone walking a tightrope on a podcast. It's boring. Yeah, and clearly Unless you got like, like good play by play. Clearly, our show is so popular. We have a whole three viewers. So that's right. Well, we we had four viewers, but I noticed that right around the time we dropped the Q word, it kind of c- like cut completely in half. So that was, uh, you know, that's probably probably a coincidence. My bad, guys. I didn't know. I'll never. Use yeah, it probably, again. probably, probably good. We stopped when we did, because who knows if, if he's dropping the Q word in the first act. Who knows what comes later? I've just mm-hmm. always assumed that if a word is sufficiently obscure and old timey enough, like I thought everyone was going to have to Google it, which would mean that just like, well, you know, it, it can't be a slur if no one knows what it means. <laughs> uh, sorry, was so, there a question I was answering or did I just? Did well, I, just I was totally I was really that? excited. I was hoping you were going to be able to riff off of the uh, you were either going to rip off the loads part or the she went down part. But like, there's so mm-hmm. much more there, you know, it's like. You know, oh, I was gonna. I was gonna say she, she's um, got loose cargo holds, if you know what I mean. Regarding that, in our very first episode on El Faro, which is a decent episode, not well produced, not edited, like at all, basically, could um, be us, but a good story. Um, in that very first one, like very tragic tale um, of of a ship going down with its entire crew. Um, sad story, but entire in very, crew's going down. But uh, yeah, oh, the whole crew going down um on each other on themselves it's a mess um all in the middle of the caribbean but uh there the term came up uh blowing tubes uh in in that first episode um which if i remember correctly was was just totally emptying her ballast tanks i think i don't remember at all i just remember blowing tubes <laughs> sometimes your ballast tanks will empty if you uh spontaneously you don't empty them before the act so yeah. It's just it's fine. You just bring a towel, right? Sometimes overnight your ballast tanks will empty on their own. 
oh, it's no. normal. Everyone, it happens to everyone. Well, the, um, the important thing is being able to laugh of it, laugh about it as a crew, and just kind of right. you know, shrug it off. And having someone to talk talk about you know that with, um, it's good to have a, a good you know crew uh, who you feel comfortable with. Um, that's that's really the the way to um, the way to uh, you know reach uh, success on the open seas. Mm-hmm. It's all about the crew. It's all about crew resource management. We talk about that all the time on the show. Do you have any other like? Uh, this is nothing I didn't want to ask about. Like, what are you? you like, I mean, you're not like necessarily going to call yourself an expert or a, a scholar, but you've done a solid amount of reading about shipwrecks now. So from your kind of armchair perspective, what would you say are your top tips for not wrecking ships? Um, well, first of all, I mean, use your available information so you don't end up, you know, driving into a hurricane uh, like we covered in episode one. Um, you know, if you're going to overload your ship, you know, maybe only overload it like twice as much as you should. Uh, once you get into the three times, four times is when you really run into some issues. Good um, Lord. With that. Um, yeah. Um, if, if you find yourself piloting a steamboat, um, if that's something that happens, um, don't overload your boilers. Um, stay away from Norwegian ships. Uh, that is actually, um, one of my very good friends, uh, Taylor, my co-host, uh, who's chiming in there, um, saying stay away from Norwegian ships. Very good mm-hmm. advice. So um, your co-host, who did not want to be on the show, is watching the show. I believe he's at work right now. Mm. So, yeah, that is, I think that explains that. Um, sorry, can you tell us the, hi. hi, can you tell us the, I'm sorry, I'm talking to your co-host there, Taylor. Can you tell us the story behind your uh, name on Twitch? I, I just read a book, and that was one of the characters' names was Sobek. Um, and I'm curious if it's got like a similar origin. He was like a river god, like crocodile river god from Egypt. Is that ringing any I will, bells? I will chime nothing- in and say, I will chime in and say yes. That's what that is. Um, oh no way! If, if cool. Taylor doesn't respond. Um, but yes, well, the that's only thing the better than an interview with uh, one of the two hosts of a podcast is an interview with the other post via like text response on like a 15 mm-hmm. second delay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's excellent. Um, but um, hey, we got both of us on here. Um, yeah, I was uh, I was talking about steamboats and um, crazy stuff in the days of steamboats. Um, you know, they make safety uh, measures. Even back then they had safety measures, you know, saying you can't. Uh, you can't push your boiler past X uh, point. Um, captains would often tie down those safety valves so that they couldn't engage um, and make it go even faster. Um, and so that's why you see so many stories about steamboats just fucking exploding uh, because they're being worked too hard. Um, so don't do that. Um, that's probably the the last piece of advice I would give. Um, don't get in duck boats ever. What are duck reason. boats? Uh, a duck boat... Um, so we, we have a whole episode about duck boats. I think it's episode 31. Uh, duck boats were a amphibious vehicle that was rolled out during World War II. Uh, they mm-hmm. were first used in the invasion of Sicily. Um, they're, they're similar to what, what you're thinking of, like a landing craft like you see on the D-Day landings, um, but they've just got wheels. So they're, like, they're kind of like Heelys um, in that sense. Um, but uh, yeah, so you could get in them uh, in the water, drive up the beach, um, and, you know, do your thing. Um, they're kind of made to be disposable, uh, not something that's supposed to be kept around for 70 years and then used for, like, tourist sightseeing purposes. Oh, no. Um, so, yeah, there's been multiple fatal uh, accidents involving duck boats. Just a few years ago, uh, the big one we covered was in Branson, Missouri, on Table Rock Lake. Um, I forget how many people died. Um but yeah, they sink very, very fast, and they're very hard to get out of if they're covered with a canopy. Oh, um, good lord! Yeah. Oh. So yeah, that was our that was our most infuriating episode, probably was the duck yeah. boats. This I'm very curious to listen to more of your episodes because I yeah listened to the Edmund Fitzgerald episode, um, and it's just it, it's really interesting to hear about. But I also like that's my two biggest fears are like deep water and 
an open space. And I think that's for the same reason. It's just such like a vast expanse of like nothingness that can kill you. Um, and so listening to your podcast also like gave me just like a creeping sensation of just like, I'm not safe anywhere. And I'm very happy I live in a landlocked province. Yeah, I we addressed this in our first episode. I kind of talk about that a little bit, but I'm like terrified of being on a boat or being on a ship. Um, mm. I would probably never want to do it. Um, they're fun to read about. Taylor's much more of a actual on the water person than I am. Um, and yeah, after doing all the research for the show, that probably isn't going to change. So, yeah. Yeah, fair. Stay on land. Mm -hmm. There's definitely something good there in what you're saying about the steamships, about how like you know you're, you know you're tying you're tying things down so that you know you can keep pushing her until she explodes. Like, mm -hmm. there we go. <laughs> also, uh, steamboats, steamboats. Come on, man. Mm -hmm. Did you want to elaborate on that? What? I'm saying there's a very big difference in a steamboat and a steamship. So let's just mm. make sure we're all talking about the same stuff here. What's the um, difference between a steamboat and a steamship? Uh, the term steamboat usually refers to like a paddle wheel steamer. Um, so like, mm -hmm. yeah, either I, I watched I watched Mickey Mouse either on the side. Exactly. Um, either on the side or on the back. Um, they actually did make center wheel steamers. They're very rare. Um, I don't even know what they look like. I don't think there's any pictures of them, but they did exist, apparently. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like they were in the movie Maverick with Mel Gibson. Or there was one. They played poker on it. I, I don't think I know that. I don't think I know that Mel Gibson movie. Oh, it's, I mean, it's Mel Gibson. It's fine. He's a, a it's genius. Is that what you were going to say? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. We actually uh, had to talk about was in it, so she's pretty we, good. we had to talk about Mel Gibson a good bit when we did our bonus episode about the movie The Bounty. Mm. Uh, so that was fun. Um, like Mel Mutiny Gibson, on the Bounty? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's that same story. Um, that one has him and Anthony Hopkins. Uh, Liam Neeson is in it too. Um, it's from the, I think it's from 1982. Um, so it's very young, very hot Mel Gibson. Um, younger, still as hot Anthony Hopkins. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great cast that movie has. Cool. I'm into it. Um, actually, I'm curious. I meant to scroll through and see. Did you guys, have you guys covered, ever covered, um, oh shoot, the ship wasn't the Franklin. I think Franklin was the captain, but it was, they were trying to find, it's a can, kind of a Canadian story. You, you referenced Stan Rogers, so I'm sure you've listened to the, um, Northwest Passage. Oh, so, are you talking? Are you talking about the um, the terror? That's the one. Mm -hmm. um, mm. We haven't we haven't done the terror, um, but I mean it's something we we might consider doing again. That's one where there's just so much devoted to it. There's a whole. I don't I don't know if you've seen this, but there's there's a massive uh, terror community on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. I mean the ship, not like. There's a lot of terror communities ISIS. on Twitter. Like, there, 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 there are a lot of terrorists in general. Um, I don't think the terror fans like being called terrorists. Um, but yeah, there's 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 um quite a lot of that going on. There's always people who have these very cool, very niche interests um, that really keep up with that story and some of the new things that keep coming out about it. Um, so yeah, we we've never done that. We've never really done um, any Arctic. Well, we've done a few things um, kind of up close to that area, but nothing really from the age of exploration. Um, definitely something we, we would look into. Um, mm -hmm. That one might be a bit big for mm -hmm. us. Kelly, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> that might, might be a bit too much for us. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, I, th I find that one, um, I guess I think I find that one curious, part partly because it's Canadian and it's like a, something that I've learned about in Canadian history, but um, partly too, because it was just recent, like, I guess recently is like, I was still in university, so it was like 10 years ago or something, but it's, it was only found like eight or nine years ago. They've been searching mm -hmm. for it for years. Um, I thought that was pretty cool that it was just yeah. like all the yeah, that's always it's always cool when you know any of these uh, you know missing ships finally do turn up, especially one with that much um, 
that much has been written and discussed about it uh, is really cool. Um, mm -hmm. we, we did also have to talk about John Franklin a little bit uh, in one of our bonus episodes when we were talking about, I think it was when we talked about prison hulks, we had to talk about him briefly for his time in Australia. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh-oh. What was he doing in Australia? I'm already scared. Uh, something administrative. He was like a lieutenant governor of something. Um, I forget what it was. Uh, something in the in the administrative, uh, probably something involving prisons. Um, but yeah, I just assumed shitty colonial things. But yeah, yeah, that happens. Um, in that same episode that we did get to talk about the basically the head guy uh, of all of the uh, the prisons in Australia or one of the areas of Australia, uh, he was actually visiting one of his prison hulks, and he. Uh, ended up getting his head bashed in with hammers and rocks. So score one for the convicts there. Uh, All right. So we, when that we, we do occasionally have happy stories on the show. Um, they're rare, but they happen like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. It, and that's actually one reason that Josie's episode was so fun, because it was a little, we could be a little bit more lighthearted with the wreck itself. Um, you know, it was more of just kind of a fun story. We didn't have to sort of pause and, and remember the fallen, at least on the, the ship itself. Mm -hmm. It it sucks when you make a really good pun and then you have to be like, oh yeah, and 24 people died. No. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to make that switch. Mm -hmm. speaking, speaking of hard to make a switch. Uh-huh. I was teeing you up. You're queuing me up. Oh, speaking of hard to make I a mean, switch. I mean, it's your show, Nicole. I just wanted um... to set you up for success. We're doing question jar. It's your show, Nicole. You tell me. Okay. Yeah. Let's do a question. One question. From the question All right. jar. So, do you want uh, to explain to Tanner how it works? Yeah. So the premise of question jar, if you're open to it, is we draw a question out of the question jar. Um, you answer the question, um, and then afterwards or during the show, um, if you can send us a question to add to the question jar, it's um, the idea is that it becomes an ever-growing thing. Okay. Um, so yeah. I, I, do, I do have one question, though. So the questions yeah. are in the jar. The questions yes. are right here as you see them. And, and, you, and you take them out of the jar. Is that, well, is that correct? We take out as many questions as you consent to answering, but anything that comes out of the jar, you have to answer it. So you, your answer can be zero. You know, it is okay. permitted. But okay, once, gonna... you, once you agree to pull it out, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna make an amendment there. You can say no at any time because that is how consent works. Cool. All right, I like it. But is that how um, the jar works? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let's do let's do a, let's do a question. All right. So, and for however many that you pull out of, however many you answer, uh, you get to add one. So, if you answer like five questions, you can add five. Cool. All right. Uh, so this one is, what's the thing, what's the best thing you've learned from a stand-up comedian? The best thing I've learned from a stand-up comedian. Best thing I've learned from a stand-up comedian actually has to do with, um, it actually has to do with, uh, my teaching. Uh, I'm always looking for more examples for teaching, uh, language in the wild basically to, to share with students and one of them comes from mitch hedberg um and he has his his very famous uh bit where he says um i used to smoke weed i still do but i used to too mm -hmm. um and what i do is what what i what i guess i have learned from that is that i can really find useful uh, useful language anywhere even where i'm not necessarily expecting to find it like in a stand-up routine um I use that in class when we are talking about the phrase used to, um, where it has that very high context of if you're using that, it indicates that you don't do this thing anymore. I use that clip uh, of, of his stand up. Um, when we're talking about that towards the end of that unit, I'll play that clip. Um, and that kind of gives me a gauge of which students understand this construction and which ones still need some work. Because if they get the joke, they've, they've, you know, internalized what this structure is for. Um, so yeah, the biggest thing I've learned from a stand-up comedian is that I can, uh, I can use, you know, content from anywhere um, and kind of use it productively. Cool. 
That is yeah, very that... funny because I actually had that exact experience when trying to help someone with their English and I like mm-hmm. used that joke as an example and they didn't get it. And I was like, okay. Yeah, but... exactly. Yeah, it's a good indicator. So was... Humor humor is such a great thing to use in the classroom. And and it's like one of those things with modern teaching. It's kind of a kind of a given that you're going to be a little bit more conversational and free. Um, you know, things aren't quite as traditional as they used to be. Um, but it really is a great indicator and thing to use in the classroom as a gauge for what students are getting, um, you know, uh, when it comes to like cultural things that they're going to pick up on. So, yeah. I, um, yeah, I actually really love that because jokes can be such a contextual, like you were saying, can be so contextual and cultural. And so like, and l- like getting a joke in another language, I've, I, so I've lived in other, in a couple of other countries where I didn't speak the language. Um, there wasn't my first language. And that that's always like a that's such a, a great feeling to either get a joke in another language or make a joke in another language and have people laugh. It's such a cool, cool experience to be like, I did this. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember the first time I ever made a joke in Japanese and I had all these like I was um, sorry, I've got a bug flying around my room. Um, there's a yeah, I made a joke in Japanese and like the um people in the room that were Japanese were like laughing at it. And it was just like such a like, yes, got it. I'm getting the language. It's uh yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure we're still waiting to have that experience that. in English, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, yeah. I've been trying to get people to laugh at my jokes in English for years. So. <laughs> All right. I could do another yeah. question if you got time. Yeah, I mean, technically, we have, yeah, we have all the time in the world. We're just being horrible to Josh the more that we uh, cut into his game. But also, he's dead inside. So let's do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, he hates being on camera, so. Yeah. Okay. So this is a question we did last time. I guess we could just do it again, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, who's your favorite obscure historical figure? Uh, my favorite his uh, favorite obscure historical figure is a guy named Marmaduke Langdale. Um, Marmaduke Langdale was a, a commander during the English Civil Wars. Um, he was a royalist commander. Um, he also uh, are how familiar how familiar are you with the English Civil War? I know it happened, and I know it was perfect. Involved. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, the big decisive battle in the English Civil War is the Battle of Marston Moor um, in 1644. Um, that's kind of where Oliver Cromwell becomes like you know the you know real dominant force that he is. Um, after that battle, the Royalists in the North are pretty much crushed. Um, one of the only contingents of the Royalist army that survives is referred to as the Northern Horse, obviously mainly cavalry troopers, um, and they're under the command of Marmaduke Langdale. Um, I think he's an interesting fellow because he, you know, he fights through the war. He ends up escaping to the continent after things go south for the Royalists. Um, he ends up serving in several different um, Catholic militaries. Um, he ends up, I believe he converted to Catholicism officially. Um, a lot of those Royalists, you know, were kind of crypto Catholics back when you still had to technically be an Anglican. You couldn't tell anyone you were Catholic, really. Um, so yeah, interesting fellow. Uh, he, you know, he has kind of the things he's well, relatively famous for, and then he has kind of a longer career. He ends up, um, you know, serving the Royal court in exile. Um, just a fascinating guy. Um, and he also, uh, he has, he had a reputation for being very, uh, very dour and straight laced. And when you see a picture of him, uh, you can, you can definitely get that vibe off of him. He's, he's a person whose appearance most definitely matches his personality. What's his name one more time? Uh, his name is Marmaduke, like the dog, uh, Langdale, L-A-N-G-D-A-L-E. He's a, he's a stern looking fellow. Oh Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna try and. I feel like before we uh, before we move on from this question, we should, uh, I think, in the tradition of the last time we asked this question, follow it up with, "Who is your favorite obscure historical fascist?" Don't even be obscure; just your favorite historical fascist. Um, and no context. Just give us a soundbite that we can clip, and we'll move on. Uh, Gabriele Denunzio. Oh, I've never even heard that one. 
I just like saying his name. I don't like him. I don't like his stuff as a person, I promise. Um, I just think he has a fun name. Um, but then again, a lot of those fascists are Italian, so all their names are kind of fun to say. Yeah, that's fair. Is, is that going to get me canceled? Honestly, yeah. I feel like you could have given... You, there's so many worse answers you can give. Yeah.